First things first, let's talk about sugar. Sugar, sugars. Trust us, you're gonna wanna use the granulated sugar too. In addition to just sugar, we're gonna be talking about candy and confections. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> We also have these special guys, which are dipping forks or spoons. These are specifically for dipping in chocolate, and we'll talk that, about that a little more later. All right, we've done a lot of sugar cooking, so let's dive in to chocolate, which is really, if I'm being honest, my nemesis. So I need you to help me get it right. I'll help you. Okay, let's do it. Okay, so we got a few different chocolates to talk about here, but first let's talk about dark chocolate. So dark chocolate and semi-sweet chocolate are pretty much the same thing. Dark chocolate is going to contain cocoa butter, cocoa liquor, not booze, but <laughs> cocoa liquor, which is the dark part of chocolate, sugar, emulsifier, and occasionally vanilla. Dark chocolate needs to contain a minimum of 35% cocoa liquor, which is surprisingly low. Yeah. It also needs to contain either 50 to 100% of cocoa butter. Often, when you see the percentage of your chocolate, that can be a combination of your cocoa butter and your cocoa liquor. Oh, that's really interesting. I didn't know that. And I think at the end of the day, if a recipe calls for dark chocolate, kind of anything in that spectrum, right, of it Absolutely. It's going yes. to work in those recipes. Unless a recipe really calls for something specific, you're not going to face a major mistake or be unable to do the recipe if your percentage of chocolate is a little bit different, right? For sure. So it, a lot of it does come down to personal preference. When you're looking for something that's very, very bitter, a baking chocolate, which tends to be 100% cocoa liquor, which is going to be all of the bitter parts mm -hmm. of chocolate, is very important. But if you're making a chocolate chip cookie and you like your cookies a little bit sweeter, go for something on the sweeter end of the spectrum. And then if you're working with something that you really want to pump up that chocolate flavor, you can go for something a little bit darker. And I think with dipping and things like that, uh, making ganache, you're not usually using unsweetened chocolate. So in, in this episode, we're mostly focusing on dark, milk, and white, you know, however you want to use them. And milk chocolate then, let's talk about how it's different than dark. So milk chocolate will include some <laughs> milk fat in there. Um, the remaining ingredients are essentially the same. So your milk chocolate, because it has milk fat, will become a lot more viscous when you're working with it. So if you're tempering the chocolate, it'll be a little bit more difficult. It will also temper at a much cooler temperature than your dark chocolate. And even further so, your white chocolate will temper even more cool. So one of the things to remember when you're tempering chocolate, is that the chocolate will temper right around the same temperature as your body. So when you're checking that temper, you want to check it accordingly going on down the scale. So dark chocolate is right around body temperature, milk chocolate even cooler, and white chocolate the coolest. So you're saying also this is kind of an easy way, if you don't have a thermometer, if you're not actually checking, you can actually just stick your finger in and kind of based on your body heat, if it feels a little bit warm, you know, it's it's gonna be a little bit too hot, and if it's starting to feel closer to your body temperature, you might be nearing closer to temper. Oh, you do it on your wrist. Do it on the inside of your wrist. So your fingers, uh, especially our fingers, yeah, I have become, no feeling in my fingers. become quite desensitized <laughs> over time. So the best way to do it is in a stainless steel bowl that you check on the inside of your wrist. The inside of your wrist is still going to be pretty accurate to a real temperature and going to represent a really good test. So if it feels just about your body temperature or slightly cool to the inside of your wrist, you're just about there. Awesome. So white chocolate obviously doesn't have any cocoa liquor in it. Is that correct? It, correct. And definitely has a lot of that vanilla flavoring in there, which I mean, we love it. You know, people say like white chocolate, it's not real mm -hmm. chocolate. It just, it has its place, guys. Like it's there's delicious. a lot of amazing times to use white chocolate. And also so does dark chocolate. So does milk chocolate. Then we also have these kind of fun extras in front of us. Well, actually there's one more that isn't a total fun extra, which I think is this one, um, which is a caramelized 
white, white chocolate. chocolate. We have a recipe for this on Food 52. It was a genius recipe ages and ages ago. It's so good where you can actually just caramelize white chocolate yourself at home in the oven. And it's exactly what it sounds like. It caramelizes the sugars that are inside and it is so good. But then it still kind of melts and behaves like regular old chocolate. So um, it's just kind of another option again for some complexity of flavor and a beautiful kind of caramel color that I love. Then we have these flavored chocolates over here that I'm obsessed with. The main component is the cocoa butter, correct? Yes. So these are delicious chocolates that you can use that will act very similar to like a white chocolate. They're pretty high in cocoa butter content and they have gorgeous flavors added to them like raspberry, passion fruit, and almond. Okay, so now that we've learned a little bit about all the types of chocolate, let's dive into tempering. This is something I really struggle with. And in school, I used to have to ask Evan to help me all the time. And the thing is tempered chocolate, what it does is it brings it to the right temperature and you're agitating it in a way that when the melted chocolate sets up, it has that beautiful shine and that beautiful snap. That's what we love. So let's clear this out, bring in some chocolate and start tempering. Before we dive into tempering, let's define one more important chocolate term, which is couverture. <laughs> couverture chocolates are any chocolates that are exceptionally high in cocoa butter. These are the best chocolates to use for tempering. So your standard grocery store chocolate chip, while delicious, isn't going to be the easiest to temper. They have a lot higher concentration of milk fat and emulsifiers that'll make it very, very viscous. It's really difficult to get the high quality finishes using non couverture chocolates. So some examples of couverture chocolates that are, you can find online or in some of your, um, you know, more specialty types of grocery stores, Valrona, which is my favorite, Calibo. Um, what else do we have? Any other recommendations? You could, you could even use some lint, chocolates if you're in a pinch they tend to get a little expensive because those bars are a little small but they do work out just fine and those are the ones you're going to be wanting to use anytime you're dipping or doing some of these things that really require that like nice snap and a nice thin coating which is like what we're going to do with some of our tempered chocolate today yes um, okay so now that we know what couverture is we've got some chopped up chocolate and evan is going to show us her tempering method. Now, why don't you start, and I'm gonna give a little disclaimer here. So Evan's method for tempering chocolate is really amazing um, because it uses the microwave. So it's a little bit less scary than trying to do it uh, some of the other ways, which we're also gonna talk about a little bit, seeding or uh, tabling. The reason I wanna give a little bit of a disclaimer is because Evan is doing it exactly how we were taught in school, um, using a stainless steel bowl. A stainless steel bowl in the microwave, you might say? What? Oh, um, but actually, this is completely fine as long as the bowl does not touch the sides of your microwave. It needs to just be in the center. There can't be any other tools, any uh, forks, knives, spoons, anything else made of metal. Not a good idea to put in there. But your classic stainless steel bowls are going to work really well. If you're too scared to do this, we completely understand. Just melt your chocolate about 90% of the way in the microwave, as Evan's gonna show you, in a ceramic or a microwave safe glass bowl. And then you're gonna wanna transfer it to a stainless steel bowl because that stainless steel is really important for the rest of the process. Cool? Okay. Additionally, it's also very important to microwave your chocolate in short bursts. Chocolate does burn very easily in the microwave. So you wanna microwave it at about 30 seconds at a time, no more, and stir it or agitate it in between so that you're getting some of the melted parts back in with the unmelted parts, and then you can move forward. Now that really brings us to kind of the concept of tempering too, which is one really important thing about tempering is you need to start with tempered chocolate. When you buy chocolate at the store, it will come tempered. When you start with tempered chocolate, it's a lot easier to maintain that temper. So if you're using this method, you wanna make sure that you're starting with a well tempered chocolate. So anything that you buy at the store will already be that way. Okay. I'm already scared that I'm gonna ruin okay. it. So I'm gonna let you take it back over because Erin is very scared of tempering chocolate. But I'm really ready to temper yep. up a notch. <laughs> we're, we're done. We're done. We're done. I did it. You kind did of, it. I almost overdid it, maybe. <laughs> so now what we're going to do is we're gonna keep stirring. The 
temperature, here, put it to the inside of your wrist. Feel mm -hmm. that it's warm mm -hmm. to the inside of your wrist. That warmth is going to continue to melt the chocolate. What you're doing right now is you're melting the fat. There's a, a few different fat crystals inside of the chocolate. Alpha and beta. And, right? Yeah. <laughs> and gamma, but that's a, oh, that's a gamma. whole other thing. Sorry, so I anyway. forgot you, gamma. So there's a few different fat crystals inside of the chocolate and what you're doing is you're trying to get them to all be friends. You want them to line up nice and neat like little soldiers all in a row. And when they line up all in the row and they hold hands because the first one started and he was like, hey everybody look like me. And then they all line up and they hold hands and they all look like each other. That's then when we get snap. That's when you get snap and shine. So what we're doing is we're agitating to promote the crystallization of that fat crystal. Because this is the same thing we were talking about in sugar cooking, which is um, time, time temperature, temperature and agitation promotes, promotes crystallization. crystallization. Yes, so. exactly. So now we're, we're working the chocolate in that regard. This chocolate in particular, while it is couverture, is a little bit lower in cocoa butter content. And so it's pretty viscous. And this will probably be similar to what we can find at home, which is great because this will really give you a good example of how to work with your chocolate at home. And how thick it might be because again, sometimes you watch these videos of incredible chocolatiers and candy makers and they pour the chocolate and it's just so thin and fluid. That's a little bit different than what you're gonna be working with with a lot of the kinds of chocolates that we can typically get at the grocery store. But it's not gonna make it any more difficult to produce the candy. It's just a little bit of a different texture. One of the other tips that I like to do and why I like to use a bowl like this, a metal bowl, a metal bowl will conduct heat really nicely. And what you're trying to do when the chocolate is warm to your wrist is you're trying to pull heat out of the chocolate. You can work on a stone surface like this or you can work on any surface really. One of the things that I kind of do is I, I dance around a little bit <laughs> and you kind of move your bowl to different areas of the counter where the counter is cold. So put your hand on the counter and feel for those warm surfaces. If the surface is warm, scoot away. And that will allow for the heat to kind of come out of the bowl a lot faster. See, that's what I was doing wrong this whole time. I've never danced. You gotta I've dance. Never done it. Just now dance. I now I know. Like no one's watching. <laughs> I just added a piece, a chunk of our seed here. So seed being tempered chocolate. This was from the store. We chunked it up. You'll notice that there's some scuff marks on the chocolate. Those scuffs are often called kisses. And that's where the chocolate kind of kisses and scuffs against each other. And it just leaves a little bit of a scratch mark on the chocolate. My chocolate here in this bowl was a little on the warm side. So I added a seed from this uh, cho chocolate bowl. And I'm just gonna continue to stir this chocolate to make sure that any of those little soldiers line up in the correct shape. All of that fat crystal lines up in the right shape that we want it to be in. And one of the other methods that we learn about a lot and that you've probably seen some on the, the interwebs is tabling. And in tabling, you agitate and help lower the temperature of the chocolate by putting it on a marble or, or another kind of cool, clean work surface. It's usually marble though. Yeah. Um, to, and you kind of just spread it back and forth and then return it to your bowl of melted chocolate. And that combined, um, um, cooling down of some of the chocolate and the agitation is gonna do the same thing as what Evan is doing. However, especially for people at home, tabling is a pretty big mess. So it is a lot of fun and it's, it's very beautiful to watch. But this method of just kind of melting the chocolate, letting it melt slowly and Adding more pieces if you need to is really, really simple and kind of in just about five minutes usually, Evan can get the chocolate tempered. And uh, with well, the next batch we do, I'm gonna do it so that I can see if I made you it You can happen. do it, you I, can do it. I just get nervous guys, but that's the whole thing. You what am I it. always telling <laughs> everybody at home that you can absolutely do it. And so I am starting this new year off by conquering my fear of tempering chocolate. And after we have tempered chocolate, what can we use it for? We can use it for everything. <laughs> Everything. <laughs> Enough said. <laughs> so once you have tempered chocolate, you can make beautiful ganaches. Butter ganaches are absolutely fantastic. We're actually going to talk about that in our bite size episode. So come back for that, guys. You can also use tempered chocolate to make uh, chocolate cups. So you can fill your chocolate cups with things like a soft caramel or with a peanut butter, any sort of nut butter. I mean, fill it with anything. Cookie you butter. Want. <laughs> then you can also use your tempered chocolate to dip strawberries, fresh fruit our nougat, our marzipan, um, 
lollipops. It's just great for anything. decor. I have a recipe on Food 52 from years ago where I uh, took a piece of parchment paper and spread a little tempered chocolate onto it and wrapped it around a cake and then peeled the paper away and there was this, you know, beautiful chocolate like kind of Color. wall on the outside of the yeah. cake. Yeah, it was really cool. Um, and, you know, mm -hmm. we talked about things like chocolate ruffles and, and stuff like that. So there's a lot of cool decor things you can do. And of course, using tempered chocolate for dipping other candies like our nougat, our marzipan, all of these things uh, are great uses for tempered chocolate. One of the things to remember with tempered chocolate is that whatever surface you put it on will be the finish of your chocolate. So if you have a highly shiny surface, like an acetate sheet or a well-polished chocolate mold, you'll come away with something that's super shiny. Whereas if you put your chocolate onto the inside of a little foil cup, the chocolate, when you release it from the foil cup, will mimic the surface of whatever mm. it's against. So even if you have well-tempered chocolate, if you put it on a surface that doesn't have a high shine, you might not see that super high shine. And when you've seen those beautiful shines before, it yeah. often is because they're using some of these, this kind of special molds or special things that really impart a high shine. Um, but again, shine does not equate to deliciousness. And today, <laughs> that is what we are focusing on. Deliciousness and that snap, because when chocolate isn't in temper, it also can come kind of be crumbly. crumbly. And we don't want crumbly caramel cups, which is what we're gonna be making with our tempered chocolate right now. So I checked my temper. I took the end of an offset spatula. You could use a butter knife or a spoon, anything of that nature. You dip it into the chocolate and you let it set away from a draft, away from the cold, away from the heat. Just let it set. With dark chocolate, it'll take about two to five minutes for it to set. You wanna look for fully set chocolate. So here I have a complete set chocolate. There's no tackiness. I'm not able to leave a fingerprint behind when I touch the chocolate. I know that my chocolate is tempered and ready to work with. I do also have one big seed still in here. Because I have that seed, I want to make sure that I don't use it in anything else. This would overseed my chocolate. Overseeded chocolate becomes very difficult to work with. There are too many of all of those little fat soldiers mm. lining up together. And then all of a sudden your chocolate goes from this luscious liquid to like set Thick. chocolate Thick. Yeah. so quickly. So I'm just going to push that big old seed off to the side and then I can work with the rest of my liquid chocolate. So I'm going to put it into a piping bag. Okay. Can I get an assist? Yes. Wonderful. Now that I have my chocolate in my pastry bag here. Some scissors for you. Thank you. I'm gonna cut a rather large tip. We wanna cut that straight across and we are going to fill these cups rather full. Because this chocolate is pretty viscous, Erin, you can go ahead. I'll and do it while you do it. Great. You can plop these out pretty quickly. This is so fun. Quickly. This is the part I'm good at. We're just gonna go ahead and turn them over. So we have our chocolate cups sitting on a wire rack on a parchment lined baking sheet. And as Evan's filling them, I'm just gonna turn them over. This is gonna help it run down the sides really evenly. And also, help the excess drain. And this is really important, like we said, with thicker chocolate, because with really, really thin chocolate, it will just kind of flow around. When you're working with anything that's a little bit thicker, and that would also go for milk chocolate and white chocolate, this is gonna be a lot easier method. So we'll just flip it over and then we'll give it a little bit of a shake to help encourage all that chocolate to fall out and fall through the rack. And honestly, we were saying this yesterday, the hardest part of this process is gonna be washing this rack later. <laughs> like the chocolate part's actually the easy part. And all the chocolate that runs through the rack can be reused. It is well-tempered chocolate so that you can continue to use it. It'll firm up nicely and you can use it for anything else. Okay, so let's check a couple of these. That's looking good. Oh yeah, cool. That's looking good. So. All the excess chocolate has kind of flowed out. And if for some reason your chocolate doesn't flow out, it might mean that it was a little bit cool, um, you know, starting to thicken up a little bit. You can always coax it a little bit. You can use the tip of your pastry bag to coax it up the walls. You can use your fingertip, anything that you want to just help make sure we've got an even coating. Now we need these to set before we try to put any filling in. Otherwise, a liquid filling, especially like our caramel, is just gonna start to combine with the melted chocolate if we're not careful. Yes. 
So we'll let them set. And like you said, it really only should take five minutes or so if the chocolate is in temper, which is just enough time to put our uh, caramel into a pastry bag and get ready to finish these cups. Seriously underrated modeling chocolate. Evan and I both think that modeling chocolate is seriously underrated. And so we wanted to show you in this episode how to make modeling chocolate. Modeling chocolate is so easy. It is only two ingredients. Melted chocolate, not tempered. Not tempered. So I extra like it. <laughs> and corn syrup. Once again, corn syrup is our friend in, in this uh, recipe. And what it does is it literally makes a chocolate that is malleable, like Play-Doh, like fondant or gum paste, and it can be used for so many things. And the one common thing that you might know, modeling chocolate or has a very similar texture, is um, a certain, I don't know if we can say the brand name though, I'm realizing. Chewy chocolate candy. Yeah. Individually wrapped. How that you might find at Halloween. Uh, and they're inside a certain pop that a certain owl has asked some questions how many, about. How many licks does it take to get to the center of, of a, a blank pop? They're shaped like this. Yeah. How you make modeling chocolate is literally just combining these two ingredients together. We're gonna combine our melted chocolate and our corn syrup until no streaks remain and that the mixture is, one of our favorite words in the pastry world, homogenous. So once the mixture is homogenous, it's still gonna be kind of chocolatey and um, fluid and stuff. It needs to set a little bit, right? Right, I think it kind of looks like brownie batter. Mm, that's so a good. Once it becomes a nice homogenous brownie batter, you're just going to turn it out onto a sheet of plastic wrap and let it kind of firm up. It'll become much more malleable and pliable like the one that I have in my hands. If it gets a little too firm, you can give it a few zaps in the microwave, just 10 seconds, and then you'll find little pockets that are a little bit softer, and you just wanna knead it like bread dough until it all becomes homogenous. <laughs> and today we're gonna use these to make a chewy chocolate center in a delicious hard candy lollipop. And we're just gonna use our lollipop molds that are safe for heat that we talked about in the equipment section. And all we're going to do, we've got our little sticks. We're just gonna make little um, rounds, or you can even kind of try to make them the shape of your mold. Like yeah, our molds you can make are a little heart, if heart you want. shaped. This is a great activity to do with really young kids because it's a it's a food safe, fun playing kind of activity. The chocolate is completely edible at this point um, and is really quite delicious. And you can make modeling chocolate with white chocolate. And, you can, yeah. Um, and, and milk, milk chocolate, chocolate. With all sorts of different types of chocolates. It, it does act a little funny at times. Sometimes the modeling chocolate, it is somewhat of an emulsion. So sometimes uh, some of the chocolates, modeling chocolates that are made with white chocolate or milk chocolate will have some of the excess cocoa butter seep away. Mm. All you need to do when that starts to happen, when you see it starting to separate or break, is you wanna massage it to get that excess cocoa butter out, and then you wanna pat it dry. You don't wanna have a film of cocoa butter on the outside of your modeling chocolate. You'll end up with cocoa butter chips inside of it. And more importantly, with this modeling chocolate, once you got it, it's great in confectionery use like this, but it also is a really great way to smoothly decorate the outside of a cake, sort of like fondant might be used, but it tastes a lot better because it tastes like chocolate. And um, also it's great for making different decorations, like Evan makes sometimes as decorations um, chocolate roses from the modeling chocolate. So after we made little modeling chocolate centers for these pops, we just did our same sugar cooking techniques, cooking a sugar syrup to 310, which is what you want for hard candy. And after it comes to the right temperature, that's when we added the coloring and any flavoring we wanna add. In this case, we added a little candy flavoring to make them taste extra sweet. Kind of merging our chocolate skills with our newfound sugar skills as well to make these really lummy, yo lummy yolly pops. Lummy lollipops. <laughs> when we were little, we used to call them poppy lops. Poppy lops. <laughs> 
So this kind of combines our new chocolate skills with our new sugar skills to make one delicious treat. And uh, this is just an example of some of the things that you can do with chocolate. So I'm gonna get all the different treats we made out here and uh, let's make a spread and show you everything that we've learned in this episode. So much for joining me, well, us, for this episode of Bake It Up and Up, where we talked about all things candy and confections. As always, all these recipes are available on food52.com, and you can find the links in the video description below. Thank you so much to my bestie, Evan, for coming and making me less scared of chocolate and showing us all the different ways that we can get creative in our home kitchens and make some yummy candy. I can't wait to see what you guys do with some of these recipes. So if you're making any of them, if this episode inspires you, please tag us, tag me, tag Food52, and use hashtag Bake It Up a Notch. We would love to see what you're baking. With that said, I think it's time to eat some candy. So right. I think I'm just going to finish off by saying happy baking. What are you going to eat? I'm going to this one. Okay, I'm going to have a lollipop. <laughs> but look how look how wonderful that it cup is. is. It is so cute. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> Mine's easier to eat mm -hmm. than yours. Mmm. <laughs>